A few days ago, uh, Carl over on InRange posted a video about an ongoing lawsuit between GWAX Armory and five different defendants, a whole bunch of people and organizations who are involved in the What Would Stoner Do project and the KP-15 monolithic polymer lower receivers. Now, um, Carl was deposed for this lawsuit. My personal involvement is, uh, well, there is none. Uh, I haven't been deposed, I'm not a party to the lawsuit, um, I'm not a party to any lawsuit, actually any lawsuit at all, which is really nice. Um, but this has raised a lot of questions online as to, like, what's going on? Uh, there hasn't been, no one's really talked about this until just very recently. It's all been ongoing litigation, everyone's been very tight-lipped about it. But I think at this point, now that silence has been broken on it, it's worth looking into what's happening and why. So, uh, my involvement, I should say, is, like I said, is that I'm involved in the KP-15s. So, the very short version of the timeline here is Carl and I, of course, developed the What Would Stoner Do uh, carbine in 2017 as a fun project, as a DIY thing. This led to all of the monolithic polymer ARs on, AR lowers on the market selling out, selling to people who were very interested uh, in building their own copy of the gun that we had put together, which was our whole point in the first place. It was really cool, it was a very successful project. In fact, it was successful enough that uh, Brownells approached us about offering it as a complete commercial option for people who thought it was a cool idea but didn't have the desire or interest or capability of putting one together themselves. They just wanted to buy it off the shelf. We thought that was a fine idea, but doing it means we're going to need monolithic polymer AR lower receivers. They're a critical component in the concept that we put together. Now around this time, uh, as I recall it, GWAX made a number of public posts that gave us the, the pretty clear belief at the time that we were never going to be able to get more lowers from them. They posted that uh, their, their uh, mold for making these things was worn out. Um, they posted that they were having to move out of their building. They were unclear as to whether it was an eviction or a voluntary move, but uh, they also, of course, posted that they were out of product, they had nothing in stock. And so uh, our takeaway from this was GWAX has no receivers, has no capacity to make receivers, and then what we tried talking to them about what we could do to get production restarted, they eventually just ghosted us. Which left us in a position of, what's another way to, to do this, what would Stoner do project, for Brownells? Well, KE Arms, is a manu an AR manufacturing company. They have employed Russell Fagan, who has deep expertise, probably more expertise than almost anyone else on the planet now, in monolithic polymer AR lower receivers. Uh, they're local to us. We have a built-in first order from Brownells for a new design of receiver. Perfect thing, perhaps KE is interested in making these lower receivers. Turns out KE was. However, the cost of actually making a mold tool was several hundred thousand dollars, and KE didn't want to foot all the risk of that upfront investment by themselves. So they went out looking for investors who would be willing to take, you know, to buy a partial ownership in the development of the mold and the mold tooling. Without going into too much detail, there is in fact a tremendous amount of engineering work that has to go into designing a mold. So there's a lot of work that goes into designing the part first to make sure it's functional, it's strong enough, it does has all the features that you want in it, and then making the mold for it, for an injection molding uh, machine, is very far from just like taking the CAD drawing of the part and making a reverse image of it. Uh, anyway, that's why it's so expensive to make a mold. It's not just the machine cutting of the mold, it's the engineering work that goes into designing what has to be cut. So. Uh, KE by like July of 2020, I'm sorry, July of 2019, had found a bunch of investors, but not quite enough. They still needed a little bit to get over the line to have what they thought they would need to actually do the project. And so at that point I looked at it and I thought, I'm a big fan of this idea. I think this has, I, I think this is something that would be really good to bring onto the market. I think we can do a much better job than the original Cav Arms receivers. Like, we can get rid of the potato grip, among other things. 
We can add elements like the flared magazine well. Like, we can do this right. I think it will be popular. I really liked the existing receivers I had, and I was very ex excited about the possibility of doing something that was the next generation and, and much better. So I threw my hat in the ring, I joined the investment, the investor group uh, to create this mold tool, and in August of 2019 KE Arms got started on the process of actually building it. So what is this lawsuit about? Well, um, from what I've been able to discern, the core of the lawsuit comes from the fact that Russell Fagan is the guy who sold the injection mold and welding tools to make these things to GWAX back in, I think it was 2011 or thereabouts. Um, the original manufacturer, Cavalry Arms, got in legal trouble, unrelated to any of this stuff, lost their FFL in 2010, and Russell thought maybe he could start doing it himself. So he bought the tools from Cavalry Arms, he looked at the possibilities of doing this for about six months, I think, uh, and then eventually sold the tools instead, decided this was more than he could bite off himself. GWAX was a company that was interested in buying the mold and starting production themselves, and so he sold it to them um, on really good terms. Like, it must have been really good terms. He worked for them for a number of years as a consultant, as a sales rep, um, various, various things that he did to help them produce uh, produce and improve and, you know, do business. Now as I understand it, uh, GWAX claims that Russell Fagan sold them intellectual property for this receiver, and that then he took that intellectual property and used it improperly or illegally in the development of the KP-15. Now my problem is, as an outside observer here, this seems to be nonsensical, because uh, what I have heard from Sean Nealon, uh, or what I've been told, is Sean Nealon, who is the guy who invented it and then sold it to Fagan, says that he did not sell any intellectual property to Fagan. Thus, Fagan didn't own any intellectual property. What I can tell you for sure is that Cavalry Arms and Sean Nealon never patented anything involved in this product. Uh, there was lots of prior art. so. The Steyr Aug is manufactured in fundamentally the exact same way as these things. It's polymer, it's molded in two halves, and it's fused together along you know, this seam. So uh, when Sean Nealon was looking at this for Cav Arms and looking at the potential cost of patenting something, why would he? Uh, it's really expensive to patent it. It wouldn't be a valid patent anyway, because this has been done for decades before 2001 or so, when this project starts. Um, and Nealon apparently figured that the cost of entry of making a mold and, and building it, like designing all the tools, <coughs> was a sufficient barrier to entry for anyone else. Like he didn't need to patent it, no one else was going to try and do this just because of the cost. Um, Nealon had ties to the injection molding industry already, as I understand it, and without those, like, it just wasn't worth anyone's time to try and copy it. And hindsight would show that he was correct. No one did try to copy this at any point while these things have ever been in production. GWAX didn't try to copy it from Cav Arms. They took the opportunity to buy the tool after Cav Arms went out of business. On top of this, I hear allegations that uh, there were you know, manufacturing processes, or like design of internal reinforcing guides, things that were, were like private tra uh, trade secret knowledge from cavalry arms manufacturer uh, that were illegally copied and used in the KP-15. Well, the problem with that sort of allegation is that I've seen a bunch of testimonials from people who were around Cavalry Arms between 2001 and 2010, and they were totally open about everything. Like Cavalry Arms didn't have any trade secrets. They would host parties where Neelan would buy a bunch of pizza, and basically anyone off the street could walk in, get some pizza, and help run the molding machine, see exactly how every element of the production worked, and actually physically help do it themselves. So to me, the idea that there's some secret sauce you know, special methodologies or anything that you that only Russell Fagan would have known is ludicrous because anyone could have known it. You could have walked in off the street. Like there are pictures out there of Sean Nealon holding up you know examples of his cool polymer lower rifle 
with the blueprints of the thing in the background. It's not like any of this was kept secret. And if it wasn't kept secret, then how could it be grounds for an intellectual property lawsuit? One source we have for trying to understand what it is that GWAX is, is actually trying to claim or trying to protect uh, is their deposition of Carl Casarda. We know some of what they asked him because he's been pretty upfront uh, talking about it. And there were questions about, like, that, that can only make sense if GWAX was trying to claim that, say, the trapdoor butt plate on an AR stock is proprietary to the CAV-15. Or quick detach slings are proprietary, and somehow uh, privileged trade secret information of of GWAX. Um, the A1 buttstock length of pull came up. Like it, it's mind-boggling to me like, how badly they must have been prepared for deposing Carl over these sorts of questions. There have been lots of depositions in this case, and I don't know much about any others, uh, but I do know what Carl said about his, and he said they scheduled him for an eight-hour deposition, and an hour and a half into it after being told that things like a specific length of buttstock and a trapdoor in said buttstock are, you know, concepts that vastly predate anything that GWAX Armory ever did. Like, buttstocks in rifles go back centuries. Um, after an hour and a half of this, they packed up all of their papers and, as he put it, rage quit the deposition, uh, leaving six and a half hours earlier than scheduled. Now, in my opinion, one of the other interesting depositions that came out of this case was the deposition of a guy named Reed Oppenheimer, uh, who, as far as I can tell, uh, appears to be the a, a, a major financial investor in GWAX. And it seems like, it looks like he was a major investor when they initially purchased the tooling to make AR lowers, and has remained a major investor, and it appears that he's the one who's actually providing the capital to maintain this lawsuit, which has been going on for two years and has really no end in sight at this point. Um, in his deposition, he actually specifically says that he is not interested in producing AR-15s for the public, that he doesn't intend on GWAX making any more uh, guns, and that he's doing this lawsuit anyway, which of course raises a really interesting question of why would he be doing that? Now, someone else out there went and did some digging and discovered that, well, you know, a lot of political contribution uh, records are public record, and uh, Reed Oppenheimer, I assume the same one, certainly looks like the same one, both out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, has funded, among other things, the Friends of Schumer, which is, well, I mean, unless that's a different Schumer than the Charles Schumer who's rabidly anti-gun, this might suggest all sorts of things. Um, now, if I try to look at this objectively, um, I can see a bunch of potential reasons that GWAX might be uh, pursuing this lawsuit in spite of it appearing to me to be completely frivolous and baseless. Like, if you had no IP to buy to begin with, and if you're relying on things like trying to prove that a trapdoor buttstock is somehow proprietary to you, uh, I can't, like, this doesn't look like a, a you know, script for a successful lawsuit to me. But maybe there are some reasons for them to be pursuing it. One hypothetical reason would be if the defendants in the suit can be convinced to just give you some money to settle and go away. Like, if your business is out of business and you want to make some money anyway, why not just try to sue someone until they just give you money to go away? That's a potential. Uh, may or may not be true. Um, hypothetically, the, they could be doing it because their lawyers tell them that they have a legit case and they don't realize just how ludicrous the case is. I don't know. Maybe that's the case. Um, you could be doing it because you are just trying to shut down uh, AR-15 manufacturing. You, hypothetically, if you're funding a lawsuit like this, maybe you just don't think people should be making or owning AR-15s and you see an opportunity to make one little dent by putting one company uh, out of business or preventing manufacturer of one. Anyway, I have gotten enough questions that I thought it was worthwhile to do a video on the subject. Um, it has been really interesting in an unpleasant sort of way, like I don't like being around lawsuits at all, but it's been really interesting to have sort of this close-up 
closer up view of this sort of shenanigans that I've read about in all sorts of historical contexts, well, now I have a chance to see one kind of up close. Fortunately not totally up close, but um, if you are interested in helping out the defense side of the lawsuit, uh, they're funding everything through sales at KE Arms. So if you want to help them, if you, if you shop with them, you will help contribute to their legal defense. Um, I suppose if you would like to help GWAX, if you see a rationale for this that I don't, you can go to their website. Um, I do want to be very clear, the internet has a way of vastly overreacting to things. Nobody should go threatening GWAX or threatening Oppenheimer or anyone else involved in the case. That's that's wrong. Like, yes, our legal system has some serious problems with it that allow frivolous lawsuits to happen, but that's not the solution to it. The solution is to fix the system. So please don't interpret this as any sort of instigation for people to go gang up on these guys. Um, anyway, uh, if I have more information I'll let you know, but that's everything that I know about this at this point. So thanks for watching. If, if you're totally not interested, well you're probably not watching at this point anyway, but we'll get back to regular Forgotten Weapons content tomorrow.